Welcome one and all church. We are so glad that you chose to join us today as we worship together. Now, I don't know where you are. Are you on a couch? Are you in a car? Are you in your home with some friends? Whatever it is, just know this. The Bible tells us that we cannot go anywhere and get away from God's presence. So He is with us today and we are going to join as one body, one group of believers ready to worship Jesus Christ because He is the one worthy of our worship. Amen. Now listen, our world is in a a state of chaos right now because of the coronavirus and that has uh, thrust this situation onto us where we're going to worship online. But it's interesting that we're going to be practicing what we preach today. How many times have you heard us say in church that the building is not church, the people are the church? Well, today that is very, very real, isn't it? Because we are one church in many, many locations. So I hope you enjoy worshiping with us today. We're going to open the Word of God. We're going to share communion. We're going to be as one thanks to this Holy Spirit in all of us. And uh, I think we're going to have a fantastic service today together. All right. Well, I would love uh, just to tell you about a few things. Firstly, uh, we have a kids ministry program. If you go to oneandall.church uh, forward slash update and you scroll down, you can be part of our kids services. You can run that after today's service as a family. We put all those resources together. There's also some things to do during the week. But before that, if you have some juice at home or if you have some bread, or even if you don't, why don't you grab that right now and we're going to enjoy communion together. Now today's communion is actually going to be one of those ones that really shows us the unifying power of communion. Because wherever we are, even across time, past, present, future, when we come to this table and when we recognize these elements, the bread which represents Jesus' body, the wine or the juice or the water, whatever it is, represents Jesus' blood spilt on the cross. It brings us together as one. The cross is the entryway into God's family. So as we pause right now and we get ready to reflect and repent and receive God's forgiveness, let's just be still and quiet our hearts and recognize the power of what we are about to do together. I just have some words of approach just to still us and prepare us to consider all that Jesus has done for us. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own that gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and you would like to love Him more. Come because He first loved you and gave Himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are His body. The Bible tells us that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this symbol represents my blood shed on the cross for you. Whenever we gather as his body and we remember the cross, we're fulfilling his uh, request that we remember him when we come and think on the cross and all it has done for us. I want to just consider one verse from Corinthians that Paul wrote for us. It said this, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all shall share in the one loaf. Isn't that an awesome thought for us today? Take a moment right now. Confess your sin before the Lord. Now take a moment to thank Jesus and receive his forgiveness into your heart. And now just take a moment to consider the fact that you are part of one body. Even though we're spread out, we are unified because we participate in this one faithful act. Let me pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you were willing to die on the cross. We thank you that you let your body be broken and your blood spilt for our forgiveness, restoration. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we receive you as our Lord and King, that you join us together into one body and we are indeed unified together. And we praise you for that today. Amen. Amen. Well, we're pretty excited around here because we started our series, The Cross Before Me, last week. And this week, we're going to hear again from the Word of God. We're ready. Our hearts are open. And we're going to discover today that there is more to the cross than you ever expected. Did you know that the cross provides a way to freedom, not just in the future when we die, but a way to freedom right now. So Pastor Jeff's going to be out in a moment and bring out our next installment of The Cross Before Me. So the cross to me represents uh, a burden. I think it represents Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. For when he came back to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. I think of hope and not only for myself, but for those around me. I like there's always the cross to run to. It's always something to remind me that I am enough. It brings new life, new opportunity. So yeah, to me that's, that's the cross. And I have to check my cross daily. Well, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you to One and All Church this weekend. So glad that you're with us. And uh, I think how appropriate it is that our theme is the cross before me. Uh, Never in our lives does that matter more than when we're facing something that we don't quite understand. And this is a great time to remember the hope that we have within us. The Apostle Paul talks about that we, we mourn, but we don't mourn as those who have no hope. And so we are saddened by crises that happen in our world. But remember, the primary message of the cross is twofold. One, that even when we're in the middle of the most difficult part of our lives, God can do his best work. The example, again, is the death of Jesus on the cross. And, and second, that there is a power that is associated with that, that God enables us to see things that we ordinarily cannot see unless something happens around our lives and our everyday living that kind of starts to disassemble any worldview that we have that will not maintain its integrity under the scrutiny of real life. And so here we are on a weekend when we are together and we are contemplating how the cross impacts uh, every facet of life. We talked about how it impacts our freedom. And this weekend, we're going to talk about how it impacts something that's very crucial. And I'm hoping that there are people who... Uh, will uh, open their eyes perhaps for the first time because for the first time in a long time, they've not been contemplating the depth of the soul and the meaning of life. There's just something about crisis that forces us into that kind of predicament. And as we do that, I want to turn our minds to the reality that there is something we need that's even greater than physical health. And your soul knows that. You know, the Bible talks about that we are made up of body and spirit. And your spirit knows that there's something that you need more than physical health because eventually everyone loses the battle uh, to decay and disintegration of the body. So there has to be something. In order for us to have a peace that passes all understanding in difficult times, there has to be something in us that knows that we are eternal, that there is a disease Uh, or a kingdom, rather, that no disease could ever reach, that there's a kingdom that is unshakable. Now, the point is then, what is it about the cross as we move forward in the series that helps us to know there's a bigger need, a greater need than the physical body? And that doesn't mean we we don't care about the physical body. We are praying for those who are suffering right now. We, We pray, we do mourn, and we ask that God would raise his hand and say, this far, no further, and this disease would be stifled in its tracks. But at the same time, we are reminded that we do have a kingdom that is unshakable, and we all want to be part of that kingdom. And if there's a God who truly loves us, then he's going to do whatever he has to to open our eyes to the reality of that kingdom and do what is necessary to embrace us so that we may be part of it. And so I want to take us on a little journey, a little trip, and I've said before that tension is the best way to learn truths that have great depth. If I just become an information dispenser, 
that's not going to create a lot of deep learning. We must go through a journey. We must have tension. And that's what I want to do is I take you toward the cross, which is the only worldview that will deal with your primary issue, my primary issue, our primary issue, which is guilt. The guilt and the shame that we all encounter through the circumstances of life. In 1960, the Israeli Mossad masterminded one of history's most incredible feats when it tracked down Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann signified terror to millions. He was a major organizer of the Holocaust. He was responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people, many of whom were children. He was the one responsible for concocting the final solution to the question, what are we to do with the Jews? And his idea was annihilation and genocide. And so the Israeli Mossad in 1960, with the help of Peter Malkin, they were able to track him down living in Argentina in South America where many of the Jews, or the Gentiles rather, uh, sorry, or rather the, uh, the, the, the men and the women who were uh, operating within the Third Reich, those had uh, escaped somehow uh, to South America. They were very much welcome there. And so they were able to track down Eichmann in his home in Argentina, and Peter Malkin would sit across the road in a borrowed car and watch the movements of Eichmann every day to try to figure out the exact time when they could take him, arrest him, uh, uh, with very little publicity and ultimately take him back to trial. Malkin writes that he watches from across the street day after day and that Eichmann goes to work at the same time every morning, returns the same time every night at around 6 p.m. And every time he returns home, there's a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, six years old, seven years old, that would greet him, Eichmann's own son. And he would throw his arms up in the air and say, hello, daddy. And there would be this embrace, this love, and this tenderness. Malkin would watch that because many of Malkin's family were killed under Eichmann's regime. In fact, Malkin had lost his own six-year-old nephew. And so he watches and he tries to answer the question, how is it that someone who is so callous and so cavalier toward life and who's responsible for tens of thousands of deaths in the gas ovens, little children, be capable of such emotion to share moments of intimacy with his own six-year-old son. Malkin struggled with this, especially as he looked at the, at the young boy, similar age, similar look, similar sweetness. Well, finally, when the moment was right with one phrase, un momentito, senor, they caught Eichmann off guard, dragged him into a waiting car, and you know the rest of the story, he was taken to trial and executed. But before the execution, Malkin had a moment with Eichmann. And he said to Eichmann, I just have to know, how is it that someone who's so responsible for the atrocities of the Holocaust, who's responsible for the deaths of so many young children in gas ovens, is capable, is capable of showing affection to his own son? when you are responsible for the death of my nephew. And Eichmann looked at Malkin and said without delay, well, your nephew was Jewish, wasn't he? Malkin sat there stunned. And he noticed there was absolutely no guilt, no remorse, as if what he had done was perfectly legitimate. And Malkin thought of Eichmann, how is this possible? How is it possible for a human being to commit those kind of atrocities and have no guilt and no shame and no remorse. Now, as you contemplate that, I think it's good to ask a few questions. The first is this, is guilt a good thing? The popular view today is no, it's not a good thing because it robs you of your life. It's attached to subjective ideas that were forced upon you by your community or by your parents or by society to manipulate you to do what they want you to do. So basically, the popular idea is rid yourself of all shame and guilt and you will be happy. My response would be, really? So guilt, as we are told, is just a feeling that we all have that is unattached to any kind of objective morality. You might say yes. Then my next question will be, well, if that's what you believe, then how can you be accusatory to Eichmann? Perhaps his feelings are just different from yours. What makes your feelings any better than his 
if it's not attached to any objective moral law. Some of you say, no, no, it is attached to objective morality. Then my next question would be, okay, what is that objective morality? What is the law that we all believe in to which our feelings must conform? And whatever that law is, it must be immutable or unchanging. It must transcend culture and social popularities. And if our feelings get out of whack and they don't conform to an objective morality, then what we end up doing is creating monsters like Eichmann. Adolf Hitler knew this better than anybody else. He said, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. He knew the only way he could get an entire generation to commit these atrocities was to remove the idea of guilt and shame, and then he could create a generation of monsters. No one understood that better than him. Remove God, remove guilt, create a whole generation devoid of conscience. Now, why is this important? Because guilt is not a bad thing. It is an intrinsic deterrent to evil. It is a warning device that something is wrong that needs to be repaired. When I was a little boy, my father would take us fishing. And I never got to do the fishing, just my father and my older brother. And my father would give me the designation of finding the worms that they could put on the hook to catch the trout in the free-flowing rivers. For the first couple years, you know, it it took me a long time to find the worms And then one day I discovered that, man, all you had to do is go over to the riverbed and overturn the rocks. And underneath the rocks, it was like a a worm convention. And I could collect enough worms within three to five minutes. I would take them over to my father. Psychologists today tell us that almost every dis-ease in the human spirit is related to what lies under the rocks of your life. And if you had the courage to pull up those rocks then you would find little guilt worms everywhere. Look under your anger. What would you find? Look under your bitterness. Look under your anxiety. Look under your inability to take criticism. In fact, psychologists tell us this. They tell us that guilt is the cornerstone of all neurosis. Everything can be tracked back to the underlying issue of guilt, and that guilt is the daily seasoning of life. So the guilt that we experience may be the daily seasoning of life, It may be the stop sign for correction, a detour to stop going this way. But if you don't respond to the guilt in your life appropriately and you shove through or push through the stop signs, then it is a daily dose of disintegration. We know down deep inside that guilt is tied to a moral reality. We know that morality is just as real as nature itself. The feeling of guilt that we have on the inside is just as real as the earth, the wind, and the sky. Now stay with me just a moment here. When I was about 16, uh, probably 15 rather, I had my first real date. And this girl that I was going on my first date with wanted to go to a place called Carowinds. It was a theme park in South Carolina. Thunderous roller coasters. And I have always hated roller coasters. I don't know why you would pay good money to have that sickening feeling. And so we went to a place called Carowinds. They had a famous roller coaster called Thunder Road. And there was no way I was going to tell this girl that I was trying to impress that I was afraid of roller coasters. In fact, I've said before that every courageous thing that men have done has been done to impress a woman somewhere along the line. And so I got on the roller coaster, I rode the roller coaster, and threw up everywhere. And so I don't think I left a good impression. The thing that I hate on those roller coasters is the feeling in your stomach when you drop stories high. And Thunder Road dropped you 15 stories. Not too long ago, we went to Disneyland and I rode the Tower of Terror, the first and only time I will ever ride it. Why you would pay money to have that kind of feeling is beyond me. Now, guilt is the feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach that somehow a ledger is being kept And when you violate the moral law that you know to be objective, somehow, some way, you're just adding one more point to the negative column. Do you know what the Bible calls that? It calls it eternity. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men, Ecclesiastes, that you know down deep inside that this world, if it has any sense to it at all, has to have some form of justice attached to it. That we all live 
in a world where one day we will all stand before God and give an account for the way that we've lived our lives. Now, again, you're thinking, why are we talking about this at a difficult time? Well, it reminds me of the story of where four friends lower a paralytic into a room and they're hoping that Jesus will heal him. Instead, Jesus looks to him and says, your sins are forgiven. Now, if you would have been the four friends of the paralytic, you would have said, well, that's all well and good, Jesus. Thanks for that. But what we're really after is a healing. Jesus is trying to show us that we're all worried about the physical, but there is a deeper issue, and it's the spiritual that impacts the outside. And so since we're all worried about what's going on in the world with an illness, I hope that we will see that when this illness is stopped, when it is stopped in its tracks, when we go back to some normality of life, I am hoping and praying that we will have the same desire to look on the inside and know there's something more, far more serious in our lives that have to be dealt with. And so somebody comes to me and they'll say, Pastor Jeff, I hear what you're saying about guilt, but if God is so good, why can't God just forgive us? Yes, I'm a sinner. I've done bad things we all have, but come on. God just needs to chill. Why can't he just say, you're forgiven? Somebody will complain and say, you know, God is so powerful. He never has to wait for things. He can just speak something into existence. Let there be light, and light was. God doesn't say, before I create light, what do I need from the electrical store? No, he's so powerful that when he speaks something, it becomes a reality. Immediately, instantly, intention brings reality. Let there be sea, and there was sea. Let there be land, sky, and animals, and land, sky, and animals. Now, let me just pause just for a moment. Just around your circles of uh, community here in fellowship, have you ever wondered what you would do with that kind of power? What would you do if you could just speak a word and it was true? I, I've made a list of some of the things I would do. First, let all cell phones be silent during the movie. I, by now, you know that I have a real problem with that. It'd be great to just speak it and all cell phones no longer work at the movie theater and I can actually enjoy the film. Or how about this one? Let all L.A. drivers learn how to merge. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool if we could just speak it and it happens? Or how about let those who talk loudly on their cell phones in public places be inflicted with the fleas of a thousand camels? That would be great. Or let all those who play videos on their cell phones at full volume without headphones on the airplane before takeoff be kicked off the plane. That would be good. And then, of course, let all those who do not understand any of the comments I just made because they're the ones committing these wretched sins, move to San Francisco and become Giants fans. They should fit right in. Seriously, though, let there be sea and sea is. Let there be land and sky and animals, and land and sky and animals exist. So why can't God say, let there be forgiveness and forgiveness is? And the answer is the cross. Because on the cross, we are told something very crucial about the character and nature of God. Let me read it again. It's in Romans 3, verse 25 through 26. We are told this. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies. God's very nature is not only love and forgiveness where he can say you're forgiven, but it's also justice. We said a few weeks ago that if a judge said to a perpetrator who had raped a young woman, that's okay, as long as you're sorry, you can go free, we would call that an atrocity. We expect justice to be upheld. And God is both just and the one who justifies. So when he sends his own son to die on the cross, Justice is upheld because sin is paid for, but his love moves in to pay the debt that you and I owe. Now, this is where the Christian worldview is different than any other worldview or philosophy. The question is, how does God deal with our violation of his objective law that is tied to our guilt? There's a reason that we feel guilt. There's a reason that we feel shame. Because when God gives his law... He does so in a way that is supposed to promote love and peace. If we, if we live within these parameters and confines, then there will be peace and there will be harmony and there will be goodwill toward men. We get outside of these parameters, then our society begins to wreak havoc on one another. So because we are all guilty of violating the law 
and therefore experience guilt and shame. How does God deal with it? And in Romans 3.25, we're told that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He deals with it through the principle of self-substitution. This is the heart of the gospel. This is why Christianity is fundamentally different to every other religious system. John Stott, one of the greatest thinkers, said that as the essence of sin, as the essence of sin is us substituting ourselves for God, the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for us. At the core of all sin is our inability or unwillingness to allow God to be God and instead attempting to usurp the power and authority of God. We all do it. I do it. You do it. We Think about it. We are society. We want to determine our own morality. We don't want an objective morality where some God somewhere is telling us how to live. That's taking over the throne of God. We live like an owner rather than a tenant. We think that everything we have is ours. It belongs to us and us alone. We don't see it as a gift from God. We live lives of egocentrism. We think the world evolves around us and what we want and our needs, rather around God and his calling on our life to be the people on planet earth that would bring peace and love and joy by self-sacrifice and generosity. All of us, I do, you do, we fight. We fight the temptation to be in control. Submission is difficult for all of us. And that in itself is the foundation for all sin. Think about it. We even come up with our own religion. And we have talked about this often. It's the gospel of morality. It's the chart that we've used so many times before. Most people come up with their own way whereby they believe they are at peace with God if God does indeed exist. And their own gospel of morality is this. Well, as long as I have more good, as long as I can write my name above the 50% mark of goodness then I'll be accepted before God. The only problem is, where is your objective truth that supplies this kind of subjective feeling? Who told you that's the way that you had to communicate or relate to God? Because the Bible teaches that God is 100% holy and pure and righteous. And if this is the way you choose to relate to him, which would be a bad call on your part, but if that's the way you choose to relate to God by law, then you would have to be 100% good and no one is. So as the essence of sin is us substituting ourselves for God, so the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for us. So because we put ourselves where only God deserves to be, he put himself where only we deserve to be. So in Christ, God came and took what we deserved. So it's still the law of moral accounting. He paid, he suffered, you owed, I owed, but he paid. That's called self-substitution and there's nothing else like it in humanity. There is no more profound and dramatic and intense principle than the concept of self-substitution. And if you think about our society, anytime you hear a story uh, that has this kind of dramatic storyline that's compelling, that's heart melting, any story that we tell of this ilk, it's the ultimate drama. When I was growing up, I, I heard often a story told that I thought for a long time was just made up. And it was the story that is still told of a man who lived with his family in the high mountains and he operated a railroad trestle. And it was over a mountain pass where every day, every single day, at a certain time, he would have to uh, lower the trestle so that the train could pass over the river. And he would also have to uh, raise it so the boat could pass under. And so that was his job. And this is the day before high tech. Uh, there was no way to contact the boat or the train. You just had to make sure that you did it at the right time each day. That was the only job. One day, he realized as the train was approaching that the trestle was open and there was no way to bridge that gap unless he got to the trestle in time. He goes into the operating system and he looks down a long way away and he sees his little boy playing in the gears of the trestle operating system. And it dawned on him at that moment he had one of two choices. He could either save the life of his son 
or save the lives of hundreds of people on the train. But it couldn't be both. Now, can you imagine that happening to a father? He has to make a decision. Can you imagine what it would be like to be faced with that choice? And do you know what happened next? Well, before I tell you, why are you on the edge of your seat right now? And the answer is because there's nothing more intense or dramatic than that. It is the ultimate storyline, the ultimate drama, when one dies so that many could live. What happened, Jeff? What happened? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's a fictional story. But it could have happened. It is fictional. But it is the premise of so many stories that we do tell. It's almost like there's some kind of imprint on our collective consciousness that this is the ultimate act, that one would die for many. And what we see in the gospel is similar and yet subtly and powerfully different. Because in the gospel, we don't have a father sending his little son down into the gears unknowingly. And we, we have Jesus Christ himself in an absolute and free and voluntary action, substituting himself for us. Do you see how this is different? No one forces him, and it's not done by accident. He does it willingly. The father willingly sends his son into the gears. The son willingly goes into the gears. Therefore, Jesus is the only person in history who chose the fact of death. You say, wait a minute, there are other people who have made sacrifices so that others could live. That's true, but those people would have died eventually at some point. Jesus is the only being to have ever existed that did not have to face death, but chose to face death in order that you and I could live. It is the substitutionary atonement that is unique to the gospel that meets the need of the human heart and gives us an objective reference to an objective truth that we can indeed live with God in eternity because it is not based on our goodness but upon an objective truth that occurred in the past, the cross of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of the voluntary self-substitution of Jesus is so precious because it tells us that Jesus Christ is the only one who ever died and made death a personal act. He knew no sin. He knew no guilt. He knew no shame. And yet he voluntarily took our place. He's the only person in history who chose the fact of death motivated by his love for us. And because we put ourselves where Jesus deserves to be at the forefront of our lives, he put himself where we deserve to be, separated from God for a moment that we could be with God for eternity. The point of this is that there's a reason we face guilt and shame in our lives. It's not a bad thing. It can be skewed sometimes, sure, but guilt is the objective reality that we must deal with objectively. We, we must have something that has happened in the past that we can tie our guilt and shame to that takes away the guilt and shame. And it can't be just a feeling. It has to be something we know to be true. In Romans 5, the answer comes in verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, please listen carefully. I know, I know this weekend that some of you may have invited some friends, and maybe some of you are hearing the gospel presented for the first time. Maybe you're sitting with mom or dad, and it's been a long time since you've had church together, but they thought, hey, since we're meeting in our home, it's a great time to get together, you know, have a meal and talk about things that really matter. Well, can I just say something to those of you who are on the outside looking in? Can I just say something to those of you who are kind of looking and asking the question, what does a pastor have to do with all the things that are happening in the world? You know deep in your heart that Proverbs is true when it says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its path leads to destruction. Your feelings, you know down deep inside, must conform to an objective reality. We intrinsically know this. What would you say to a parent who said, you know what, I feel like encouraging my little boy to play in the middle of the street is an incredibly safe endeavor. What would you say to a parent who said, you know, I feel that feeding my child candy and sweets 24 hours a day and nothing else is the best thing for him? What would you say to a parent who said, I feel that helping my child avoid any exercise of any kind will help keep him healthy? You would say that that parent is not in touch with reality. 
Now, what if the feeling that you have about heaven and hell and salvation and sin and righteousness and forgiveness, what if those feelings that you have are feelings that are not tied to any objective reality? Then that means that where your son's physical life is at stake, the reality is with you, your eternity is at stake. You think that you know the way, but it's tied only to your feelings and emotions. It's tied in no way to any objective truth or reality of the past or the present. Let me say it again. Guilt is an objective reality we must deal with objectively. It can't just be a feeling. It's got to be something you know to be true. The feeling of being justified and being secure for all of eternity has to coincide with an objective reality. And the reason that's important is when times like these come into our world, your soul is going to know whether or not your worldview is tied to something that is objectively true or some feeling or whim that you have about life. And the disintegration of the soul will begin. On the cross of Jesus, God gives us an objective reality that sufficiently deals with our objective guilt. The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith in what Christ has done, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This Greek word for peace is not the word for subjective peace, not the feeling of peace, but with an actual objective peace. You can know that you are at peace with God because of your faith in what Jesus has done on the cross to forgive you of your sin. Therefore, you can rest assured that you are even on days that you don't feel like you are, part of an eternal kingdom that no sickness or no disease can ever touch. It is an unshakable kingdom. And your soul will know that if you're living for that, you'll be able to have the peace that passes all understanding. That's where your guilt and shame are dealt with on the cross, and you know you're in good standing with God, and you know you are part of an eternal kingdom that will never fade away. But a problem still exists, doesn't it? Because we've talked about objective truth, but there is a sense in which all of us want to feel. We want to feel the peace, too. We don't want to just have an objective peace. We want to have a subjective one. And this is where the Bible in the gospel talks about this, too. In Galatians 4, here's what we're told. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption to sonship. Now, what is the Bible telling us here? We're asking the question of how can we use this objective truth that we know that Jesus died for our sins, how can we use that to live guilt-free, shame-free lives, to know that we're in good standing with God? Remember, psychologists tell us that guilt is the primary cause of all neurosis. So whatever illnesses we have, down deep inside, if we pull up the rocks, we're going to notice feelings of guilt and shame that even though we spend our life trying to shove them to the side, they are no less real. How can we have peace in the midst of that, both big and small? The Bible tells us that if you don't deal appropriate with the guilt and shame, if you do what popular theorists tell us we should do is deny it. What's going to happen is you're going to create little and big monsters. Uh, I remember, because we all think of atrocities, and I used Adolf Eichmann earlier, but the reality is every single one of us, when we deny the shame and the guilt and we don't deal with it appropriately, we can become little monsters. The way we treat each other, the way we respond. I remember reading the story in the mid-80s about a young high school girl who was pregnant and went through graduation, and then uh, it was prom, or it was a celebration, graduation, celebration party, rather, and she noticed during the party or celebration that her water had broken. She went into the bathroom, delivered the baby, put it in a plastic bag, tied it up and threw it in the garbage can, and went right back out and continued to dance as if nothing had happened. Sometimes when we look at our world, we wonder why atrocities like that can happen. But they're happening every day, and the reason is, is because when you don't deal with guilt and shame, we create both big and little monsters. People who have lied to themselves, 
that guilt and shame are not real, that they're not roadblocks to stop you from continuing down the road that you're going. But if you want to deal appropriately with your guilt and shame, on the other side of it is healing and restoration and peace of mind. But here's what Jesus says. He says the only way that you're going to successfully deal with your guilt is when you are first willing to admit the magnitude of your sin. If you deny guilt, you become monstrous. If you admit your guilt, you cure the disease, the dis-ease. So stay with me here. Let me, let me uh, hit, bring this thing home just for a second. You know, there are some drinks that you can drink that are quite hot, and for some reason you can't really taste them, and you can't even really hold them, but for some reason you still manage to gulp it down. <laughs> it, it's an amazing thing. How, how, how can you not taste it or hold it, but yet somehow you can drink it? Uh, I remember playing a game when we were growing up in Tennessee where we would try to move logs from one place to the next, and they were quite heavy. So you'd pick the log up, and then you'd try to throw it to move it to advance it. The problem was, if you didn't have all of it, all the weight on yourself, you'd throw it up and try to run from it, and then it would go the same angle you would and kind of take you out along the way. And the point is, the only way to take control of this thing of shame and guilt that are in our lives, that's causing this disintegration of the soul, and the concern and worry for a kingdom that is shakable, the only way to deal with that is to take all the weight of the log, to gulp all of it, to take every bit of your sin, all of the weight onto yourself, and then, at that point, heave it all over to Jesus. Jesus invites you to do this. He wants this. But you know, that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. In fact, when I talk about sin and how much we have in our lives, even though sin is empirically verifiable, even though 99.9% .9 of the things that happen in our world is because of what we do to each other. Still, when I talk about the measure of sin in a person's life, they become uneasy because somehow they just don't want to admit that they have that kind of guilt or shame, which is an example of how we believe the lie of culture, that the best way to live our life is to ignore it, and we don't realize the little monsters we can become. I remember years ago, a BBC reporter by the name of Gerald Priestland. He did a series of programs on religion on the BBC. And in one of the episodes, he told a story of how he had been raised as a Christian, but had always been guilt-ridden. And he wanted to know, how can I get rid of these feelings of guilt that Christianity gave me? And in his testimony, this is what he said. He said, you know, I used to see Jesus on the cross, and it was a terrible sight. Because all I would be told is, look how sinful you are that you made that happen. And then one day I was on the therapist's couch and I realized that the only way I could ever feel confident and bold was to get rid of the idea that somehow I was a sinner and get rid of the idea that there was a cross and get rid of Christianity altogether. And he says, that's how I became the wonderful man I am today. Now, do you see the inherent contradiction? Imagine for a moment... You're about to lose your home, and you're going to lose your home because you were so far behind, and you've not been able to pay the payments, and you've owed so much money that finally the mortgage company is on the way, and they're going to take back. They're going to repossess your home. You're going to be thrown out, and you know down deep inside it's all because of your financial mismanagement, your stupid bonehead errors, and yet at the very last minute, right before the bank's going to take the house, a friend of yours comes over, puts down a check on the table of the exact amount that you need, puts it on the table and says to you, here is my gift to you. This is all you need. You're going to be saved. Now, what would you do? How much sense would it make if you gave the check back and you said, oh, my friend, that check is a terrible sight. Look at that number on that check, $50,000. Every time I see that, it just reminds me of the terrible person I am and that I would need that kind of saving or generosity. It reminds me of my foolishness that stubbornly caused me to be in enormous debt. I hate the sight of this check. Take it out of my sight. That's what Gerald Priestland is saying, that the cross is horrible because it makes me feel like a sinner. And the, the question is, has, has, is this what it has come to? Are we this arrogant? Are we so prideful that we would rather die separated from God for eternity at dis-ease in our spirit we would rather live that way than to admit 
that we need to be saved and that we need to be rescued. That is the point of the cross. Yes, the, the debt is huge. It reminds us of who we are and what we have done. But in one single act, one act of sacrificial love, atonement, you can now glory in that number. The number reveals the depth of the love of your friend. The same number that haunted you, you can now glory in. The same number that depressed you now becomes your glory. Jesus often told stories, and he would give the punchline, he or she who is forgiven little loves little, but he who is forgiven much loves much. That's how I know that a person's life has been transformed by the gospel. Somewhere along the line, they realized I have an enormous debt, but Christ has forgiven me. They're the ones when they come to a worship service, whether it's in a home or in a corporate facility, they, they begin to look to God and their whole life flashes before them of all the wrongs they have done. But soon and very soon, just quickly like that, suddenly they recognize the enormous gift that God has given them and how they have been forgiven. And that catalyzes a spirit of worship that they just want to praise and worship God because the debt has been paid in full. You know, I tell you, the older I get, the older you get, I think, as a Christian, your prayers began to change. You know, when you're younger, you go to God and you pray things like, God, give me success, Uh, give me a job that's going to pay a good salary, Uh, help me to gain my significance in the world. God, it's, it's just give me this or give me that. God, let me have this or let me have that. Then you get a little older and you're praying, God, you know, I pray that my body wouldn't break down. I pray that I wouldn't get ill or become physically debilitated. I pray for my grandparents. You're always praying, asking God. But the older you get, it changes. You are still mindful of those things. And you still mention those to God. But your primary passion the older you get is this. And this is how you know that Christ is changing you. Your primary prayer becomes this, God, I want to know you, really know you. Because when you think of what he's done for you, you want to get to know someone who was so willing to do for you what you could not do for yourself, that was willing to give up what was most precious to him, his own son, so he would not lose you. You think, I want to know someone like that. What is God truly like? And that's how you know that you've been touched by the cross. When you take in all of your sin and then you give it all to Jesus, you will begin to feel subjectively the objective reality of forgiveness. And that's supposed to happen the moment you believe. Now, stay with me. This is the end. It happens because the Bible is clear. It tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So the whole message there is if God loved us so much that he did what was necessary for us while we were still sinners, when we weren't seeking him, when we weren't looking for God, and yet he still provided a way to find him, that he reached down to us instead of waiting for us to reach up to him, if he did that while we were sinners then how much more is God going to treat us with loving kindness on the day of accountability when now we are no longer his enemies, we are his friends? The Bible tells us we've been adopted into the family of God, not because we're good, but because we've assumed our debt, we've given it completely over to God, and now we can live shameless, guiltless lives. And the moment that you believe and are justified by his blood, the Bible tells you that you will be loved as much as you will ever be loved. God's never going to love you more than he did when you first came to him. And how much easier then is it for God to handle us in judgment since he's already handled us here. And while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The doctrine of the cross of Jesus. Two final illustrations quickly. The doctrine of the cross of Jesus is very much like the sun and the stars. When the sun is up, even though you know the stars are there, innumerable stars, they can't be seen because they are covered by the glory of the sun. And when you understand what Jesus has done on the cross for you, it shines out in your life. That even though you know there are all those innumerable sins down on the inside, 
you know that God does not look at them because they are covered by the glory of the sun. One of the greatest Christian works ever written is called Pilgrim's Progress. And in Pilgrim's Progress, there's a man whose name is Christian. And he's journeying along. And he has this huge burden of guilt and shame on his back. And he doesn't know how to get rid of it. And Mr. Legality tells him to climb up the mountain of morality. And he says, when you get to the top of the mountain, the burden of your guilt and shame will just fall away. So Christian starts to climb the mountain of morality. And along the way, he says to himself, you know, I don't understand why this burden is not getting lighter. If it's true that when I get to the top, that the burden will be cast off, cast away, then why is the burden not feeling lighter the closer I get to the top? Finally, he comes to a hill, and at the top of that hill, at the top of the mountain, is a cross. And below the cross, at the bottom of the hill, is a grave. And when he gets to the top of the hill, he looks up, he sees the cross, and just seeing the cross causes the burden to fall, roll down the hill, and into the grave. And he was amazed. And it says that he kept looking at the cross, just staring at the cross, and the more he looked at the cross, all the burdens, all the shame, all the guilt, rolled down into the grave, buried, dead. And the more he looked at the cross the more finally he began to understand until the springs in his head were loosed and water came down his face and he gave three jumps of joy and he sang, blessed grave, blessed cross, blessed be the one who died for me. There it is. That is the answer to the burden of guilt and shame, the provision of forgiveness. And for those of you listening right now, two groups, one, For some of you, you've been carrying around this guilt and shame long enough time to lay it on down. Stop denying that it's there. It'll just make your soul more and more sick. And when times like these enter into our world, you will be more and more fearful because your soul will know there's no objective truth that you have tied your security to. It's all feeling, all emotion. Go ahead and give up your guilt and your shame at the foot of the cross and go free, not because you're good, but because Christ is good and did for you what you could not do for yourself. Then there's another group. You've never really admitted the depth of your sin. And when somebody like me talks about it, it offends you. You're offended that I would put you in a category of a sinful person. And because of that, you've never been able to take responsibility for the guilt and the shame. And if you don't take full responsibility, you can't give it fully over then to Christ, to forgive. And I'm asking both those categories of people to make this the final weekend where you carry the burden of guilt and shame. Those of you who've got something in your life that you don't know how to handle, you don't know how you're going to deal with it, please hear me on this. It is a greater sin for you to believe that Jesus isn't big enough to carry your burden of guilt and shame than it is whatever caused the guilt and shame. Don't nullify the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. He is able to forgive whatever you've done, no matter to who, what, and when. In one instant, because of the power of Jesus' work on the cross, there is no other atoning sacrifice offered to you than through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to ask everyone who's gathered around this weekend, if everybody would bow their heads and everybody pray this prayer, and some of you are going to be praying it for the first time, if you would bow your heads and pray right now and repeat after me. You can do it in your spirit or you can do it out loud. Either way, here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge my sin. Forgive me for underestimating your law and holiness. I see now the great distance between us because of my sin. Thank you for sending Jesus to bridge the gap. I repent of my sin. I ask you for forgiveness. Take the burden of my sin and shame away. I cast all my cares on you. I resign my old way of life and place my trust and hope in you. 
I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, you're with us this weekend and you did that. There's going to be a yellow button on the screen that you can push, tap onto, and follow the instructions. Let us know the decision that you've made. But I would pray that for both those who are near to God and those who are far from God that want to come near, that your eyes would have been open this weekend, that there's only one way to deal sufficiently with the guilt and the shame that we all feel, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ that promises us a kingdom that no disease can ever touch. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the way you meet our needs. Thank you for the power of the cross. And I would pray right now that your Holy Spirit would be working in the lives of families of sons and daughters and fathers and mothers and aunts and uncles and cousins as they all come together. And perhaps for the first time, they've heard the good news of the gospel. Father, help us to remember that ours is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Ours is not a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, of a sound mind. That Jesus is still on the throne. That although this world may be shaken, we will never be shaken. And there's nothing that can truly touch us. Because Jesus has offered everything to us. And the world can never take from us what Jesus has already given to us. In his name we pray. Amen. So now we have an opportunity to worship God, to respond to Him in times that are uncertain, in times that are chaotic. And we could put our trust in knowing that we serve a God and we praise a God who is faithful even when we are not. And so right now, you may wanna join us Maybe you're somewhere, you might want to stand in this moment. You might want to kneel. Or maybe you're just with your family sitting on the couch. And it's just as much of a worshipful moment as we trust in God and direct our praises to Him. Wherever you are and whoever's around you, come to the altar and He'll meet us there. Let's worship.
Thank you, Father. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love. And oh, what a Savior, isn't he a lot different than it did just three short weeks ago. Businesses, schools, and even the sports world have shut down. But I'm here to tell you today that the church of Jesus Christ has not shut down. It won't shut down. It never will. And the reason is, is because God's Spirit, it dwells within you. And church is not a building, it's a group of people. A group of people fueled by the Holy Spirit to be Jesus' hands and feet. In Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 20, we see that Jesus says this. He says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Church of Jesus Christ. During this crisis, amidst the chaos and the confusion, this is our opportunity to rise up and to be the church and to see people far from God come near. And you might ask, how? Well, the answer is, we're going to serve. 
In fact, there were a group of one, one and allers this weekend who were already being the hands and feet of Jesus right here in the city of Azusa, providing food for those who've been affected by this crisis. And we're committing as a church that we're gonna be there each and every week, providing for those in our valley, as well as all over this world who are in need. And this is where you can play a part. It's through your generosity that this mission is fueled. And so as you're watching online, for many of you, this is going to be the first time that you give online. You can pl the, click the Give Now button, or you can also simply go to oneandall.church slash give. Follow the steps there, and you can give. And as you give, be reminded of the fact that it's your generosity that fuels the mission of people far from God coming near, the gospel going out far and wide. This is our opportunity to be a city on a hill, for Jesus to be manifest in the world around you. This is our opportunity. So let's not miss it. When everybody else is running away, let's run towards the mess. Let's be Jesus' church and let's watch him do amazing things among us. Let's continue to worship. Church, would you continue to worship with us?
stop us. We're going to praise God together. Come on. greatest prevention to the disease of the soul is the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why we always end our services. And I want to do that this weekend. Matter of fact, I want you to shout that final phrase so loud in your homes and communities that your neighbors start to wonder what happened. We say there is one hope and one life and it's where? One more time. One hope, one life, Christ. God bless you. See you next week. Congratulations on finishing another video here at the One and All YouTube channel. I'm so glad we got to experience that together and I'd love to experience another video with you. So why don't you pick this one right here, this video, 
or you can subscribe right here. And I'd love it if you were inspired by this video in any way, if you would take the time to hit the like button, comment, and even consider sharing this content with a friend because chances are if it inspired you, it's gonna inspire somebody you know. Let's continue on this journey together and watch another video.